Maro Mugnai. Um, do you see the phases of the membranes to be reorganized by the growing droplet? In other words, does the droplet change the morphology of the lipid membrane? Um, yeah, the, if we have a droplet that's pretty stable, um, then it can yeah, uh, reorganize the, the composition of the membrane by um, changing yeah, the composition in these tethers. Um, so it can, yeah, uh, it, it ch change, change how the surface phase of the membrane behaves just based off of uh, these, uh, where you line this bulk phase diagram. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, other questions? We will wait. We have um, a couple of minutes since we had a few issues in the beginning. So any questions from students? Postdocs? Don't be shy. Um, okay, wait just a bit more. Any questions from faculty? And then we can, you know, come back. Uh, I had a question. Uh, is in the case of the postsynaptic density that you mentioned, do we know that there is some phase, non-trivial phase diagram of the lipid composition of that region of the dendrite, of the neural dendrite, uh, mm -hmm. that goes along with the postsynaptic density, or it's just, or that's just a motivational example for the general theory that you developed, which was very nice. Yeah, I think. Um... The, the second is, is, is more of the case that uh, I haven't yet dug too far into the literature of, um, of the lipid composition of, of these membranes, but I know it does change as like in rat brains, it will change as they age uh, between saturated, non-saturated lipids. So it's like, we don't know if these membranes are critical um, at the sample density or if they're phase separated, but it's feasible to believe that um, th this composition matters, I guess. Um, and they could tune where you line this phase diagram to tune the stability of, of postsynaptic densities. Thank you. Great, thanks. Other questions? Students? Um, postdocs, faculty? Okay, if in case people are gathering their thoughts, um, I, I had a question. Do you know what the length scale is for these uh, for these droplets, and do they show coalescence? Um, and um, you know these yeah, um, surface droplets. So in the, um, actually, I, I don't have a hard number on like the, the, the biological length scale of um, how yeah how big these surface bound droplets are in relation to like a, a cytoplasmic droplet. Um, but um, generally, um, I you'll. Know, Oh, wait. Sorry. Sorry, we're breaking up. Um, um, yeah, uh, so like in uh, this example of um, the unfolded protein response, which actually occurs in the, um, in the ER, um, these uh, are, have been shown not to coalesce, but like, um, uh, and they're, you know, maybe deep within the bulk phase diagram, so um, more of a gel-like state, but um, uh, the rim rim banding protein or um, or lat clustering, those are very much liquid-like droplets. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, there are no more questions and in the interest of time, um, I'd like to thank uh, Mason again for a really interesting talk, thanks. And we will go to our next speaker um, who is Sagar Setru. And uh, Sagar, you can start uh, sharing your screen. Sagar will talk about a hydrodynamic instability drives protein droplet formation on microtubules to nucleate branches. Again, another talk on another aspect of phase separation. Okay, you can start when you're ready, Sagar. Great, thanks. Uh, can you, can you, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sagar. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for putting together this session. Um, and thanks to you all for attending. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, how a hydrodynamic instability uh, drives protein droplet formation on microtubules to nucleate branches. Uh, and so to begin, I'll start with a movie of spindle assembly uh, during cell division 
and a quick back of the envelope calculation. Uh, to make and maintain the existence of one human, it takes about 10 to the 16th cell divisions, uh, which means you have to make the uh, same number of spindles. Uh, now each spindle has about 10 to the fifth microtubules, uh, which means that over the course of your lifetime, uh, you have to make around 10 to the 21 microtubules. Uh, so that's clearly a lot of microtubules. How is such a feat achieved in biology? Uh, well, you could imagine that geometric growth uh, and the number of microtubules uh, rather than linear growth uh, would be a quicker way to get to 10 to 21. Um, and it's actually via a geometric process that, that most microtubules in the spindle are made. Uh, specifically, the majority of microtubules in the spindle are made by branching off of existing microtubules. Uh, here, uh, we've reconstituted the branching process in vitro uh, by purifying cytoplasm from cells, uh, which leads to the formation of these dense networks of branched microtubules. And so this process, branching microtubule nucleation, is, is something that we're really interested in. Uh, we've studied the mechanism of this process, and we know the various factors uh, that are uh, necessary. Uh, you don't need to know them all, um, but one in particular that uh, we focus on and, and, and that uh, the research that I'm talking about is focused on is this protein called TPX2. Uh, so you can see here that when we uh, fluorescently label TPX2, uh, it, it localizes to the microtubules just before uh, branching is initiated. So um, it's not, so I want to point out though that it's not just TPX2 that's needed. Uh, there are multiple factors involved, right? Like the factors in this list. And a crucial point um, to know is that they all need to localize in the same place at the same time on the microtubule uh, to nucleate a branch. And so the question uh, that really motivates the work that I'm gonna talk about today um, is how do multiple factors localize at the same place and time uh, to nucleate a branch? So knowing that uh, TPX2 is what initiates the branching process, uh, we began by looking at TPX2 on the microtubule in vitro. Uh, and as research from our group had previously seen, uh, we noticed that the protein uh, quickly and uniformly coats microtubules and then forms uh, droplets along the microtubule. So this was a very interesting result, uh, but here we're looking at a rather high concentration of TPX2. So this is one micromolar TPX2, uh, which is 10 to 20 fold higher than the physiological concentration of this protein in the cell. And so the next question we uh, wanted to ask was, uh, do droplets form at a lower protein concentration? And so we looked at a lower protein concentration. So here we're looking at uh, 0.1 micromolar TPX2. So this is a 10th of what we were looking at before, uh, but we didn't see any droplets form on the microtubule via fluorescence microscopy. However, uh, we hypothesized that the droplets are important for making branches. So we wondered uh, how can we see protein droplets on microtubules at a lower, more physiological concentration? Um, we decided to seek a technique that would give us better spatial resolution. And so we turned to atomic force microscopy and we did the following experiment. Uh, we first scanned uh, the surface of an uncoated microtubule. Next, we added uh, the protein and then resumed scanning the surface of that microtubule. Uh, we used uh, a technique called peak force tapping uh, by which we can set the maximum force applied. And so this helps us avoid uh, destroying uh, our sample. And as operated, uh, we achieved resolution near several nanometers axially and uh, in the sample plane. Um, in the sample plane, this is achieved just by simply rastering in, in, in about eight nanometer steps. And so this is a significant improvement over optical microscopy. So when we do this, uh, we generate topographical movies uh, like this of microtubules before, during, and after protein concentration. Sorry, after protein coating, excuse me. Um, so we see that initially the height signal uh, reads about 25 nanometers. So this is the, the, the top, top right uh, topograph uh, in this image. Um, and then once TPX2 coats the microtubule, the height signal increases uniformly along the microtubule. And then once droplets form on the microtubule, the height signal demonstrates uh, a punctate pattern uh, that also exhibited some periodicity. So um, topographical line scans along these microtubules uh, confirms that 
um, protein coding was indeed periodic after droplets had formed. And so we did this for many microtubules and consistently saw a uh, uniform film break up into a periodic array of droplets on the microtubule. And so this is shown in the average power spectra of line scans across uncoated, initially coated, and droplet patterned microtubules. Uh, specifically uh, in the red curve, so after droplets are formed, uh, power spectra show a peak, uh, which is consistent with the existence of systematic periodicity in the data. We next wondered how this periodic pattern of droplets arises. And we had the idea that the condensed film on the microtubule is undergoing what's known as the Rayleigh plateau instability. Uh, so this is a classic everyday hydrodynamic phenomenon in which a cylinder of uh, liquid uh, will beat up into droplets to minimize its surface area. Uh, seen in this movie, so here I'm just um, squirting some water out of a pipette. Uh, it leads uh, a stream of water to turn into droplets. Um, this uh, phenomenon also happens when a fluid coats a fiber. Uh, so the geometry of the, of the problem is shown here. Uh, you, can, you can get a sense of, you can already get a sense of what happens uh, if you consider that the fluid is incompressible and that the goal uh, is of the fluid is to minimize its surface area. The formal treatment starts with Stokes equations for viscous flow at low Reynolds number uh, and will give you the, the following prediction uh, that the spacing between droplets, uh, which we uh, term a, a maximum wavelength or lambda max, uh, is a function uh, of the initial film thickness. Now you can convince yourself that this is a reasonable description of the phenomenon with some quick experiments with a wire and glycerol. Uh, so by withdrawing the wire quickly or slowly, we'll make a, a thicker or a thinner film uh, and then see droplets with larger or smaller spacings. So the question of course is, is this true for TPX2 on the microtubule? So here is the prediction by theory, and here is what we measured by AFM. Uh, so we see that indeed thicker films yield droplets with larger spacings. Uh, note that there are no uh, fit parameters here. So this is a uh, theory is purely geometric, and uh, we've essentially just thrown the data on top of the prediction. Uh, however, you might notice that our theory actually predicts a systematically larger spacing between droplets than we measured. Uh, and this is because uh, theory assumes axial symmetry the, that is not uh, actually present in the experiments, right? So, so in our experiments, the microtubule is resting on a surface, which includes part of the microtubule from being coated. This means that the volume that coats the, the microtubule is less than if the microtubule were not surface bound. And since droplet spacing is proportional to height and height is proportional to volume, uh, we will indeed predict larger wavelengths than what we actually see. Um, but you can do a quick calculation for an effective height uh, based on a volume closer to what when the microtubule is on a surface. And the result looks like this. Uh, so this is the blue curve uh, in line. And so this is in line with our intuition for the overestimate um, of the uh, uh, axially symmetric prediction from theory. And uh, I also just want to note that the second prediction is still purely geometric. So no fitting was done. And so the agreement with data arises naturally. So, so this is great. So I've shown you that droplets form on microtubules and that we understand the physics behind why they form. But uh, why do these droplets on microtubules matter? So to address this, uh, we reconstituted the entire branching process in vitro, uh, a feat that our group recently achieved by including all of the necessary factors for making a branch. And uh, what we observe is that branches nucleate from the TPX2 droplets. And so this shows the droplets have a functional role. Uh, they can co-localize all of the factors necessary. And this led us to the following hypothesis. So we hypothesized that uh, droplets make it quicker for multiple factors to co-localize the same place and time on the microtubule by reducing the search space along the microtubule for multiple factors to co-localize. So to test this, we simulated the binding and unbinding of two factors to uniform film versus periodic array of droplets. And we saw that droplets demonstrated a lower co-localization time tau. Um, and so we, 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 we think that uh, what droplets are doing is making uh, branching more efficient by reducing uh, the time it takes for these multiple necessary factors to co-localize. And now this may seem like a modest effect from these histograms, but you know, again, when you consider that to make and maintain the existence of a human, you need to make 10 of the 21 microtubules, the majority of which are branched, and that for each branch, you need to co-localize 
at least these four factors, uh, we think that this effect will end up uh, adding up uh, to make life more feasible. Uh, so to summarize, we see that TPX2 breaks up into droplets uh, on the microtubule via the Rayleigh plateau instability, and that droplets can more quickly co-localize multiple factors. Uh, we also note that similar observations exist in the literature for other proteins, and so we think that such hydrodynamic instabilities are likely a common theme in biological self-organization. With that, I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, specifically Bernardo Gouveia, a theorist who worked with Howard Stone, who contributed equally to this work. Uh, Ray Alfaro Akko, a talented biochemist in the Petri lab, as well as my advisors, Sabina Petri and Josh Shavitz. This was a really fun project put together by a great team. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Sagar, for a fantastic talk. Um, very cool movies. Um, and the um, floor is open for questions. And again, feel free to write in the chat or unmute yourself. Encouraging students and postdocs. <clears throat> okay, so there's a question from Maro Mugnai. Does TPX2 coming from solution uh, or come from solution and not from the Sorry, does TPX2 coming from solution and not from the microtubule contribute to growth? Yeah, so um, I didn't talk about it uh, here, but uh, one of the things that we did was uh, model the, 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 the growth of the condensed film on the microtubule. Um, and I also did it, didn't show it, but um, we actually tested a range of different bulk concentrations and, and yeah, so, so with a higher bulk concentration, you get a thicker initial film. Um, and, and then that leads to, to drop bigger droplets, or droplets spaced farther apart. Um, but so yeah, so, so a greater bulk concentration will lead to, to a thicker film. Uh, does that answer the question? Um, I think so, thank you. But Moro, you can feel free to follow up if you need. Um, there's a second question from Isabella Graf. I was wondering whether it is clear that TPX2 recruits the other factors, e.g. Aukman, or could it also be the other way around? Yeah, that's a great question. And this, uh, so the, the, the recruitment and the order of binding of, fa of these factors to the microtubule um, is work that's been dissected uh, by, you know, across multiple studies from our, from our group. Um, but so, so, so the answer is, yeah, TPX2 goes there first. And we know this because, um, you know, we deplete TPX2 from cytoplasm and then add the different factors in different orders. And, and you don't, you know, branching only happens if, if TPX2 is added first and then augment is added. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, there's a question from Garrick Papayan. Great talk. Do you think this is an equilibrium effect based on surface tension minimization, as you said? or actual dynamics, hydrodynamics, plays an important role too. Uh, the, 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 surf, the, the fact that the fluid wants to minimize its surface tension leads to uh, this dynamic behavior in vitro. Um, and the in vitro, I mean, the in vitro experiments, so all it, that is in the in vitro experiments is microtubules and TPX2. And so there's, you know, that, that is an equilibrium. So I guess I'm a little, 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 conf I mean, yeah, the dynamic behavior arises because the fluid wants to minimize uh, its surface area and it wants to minimize its surface area because of surface tension. Um, Garrick, if you want to follow up, feel free to. Otherwise, um, in any case, there's a follow-up from Ben Makta. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm skipping. There's a question from Feng Wan. In your AFM experiment, how do you keep the protein concentration constant for 60 minutes, considering that the uh, buffer may evaporate? Uh, the buffer probably does evaporate. Um, the microtubule, uh, so the, the TPX2 is a very high affinity for the microtubule. And so 
whatever microtubules in the bulk solution uh, quickly quickly wets and saturates the uh, the microtubule. So so the, the the film on the microtubule grows very quickly, um, and so you know we don't we don't see that the the, the 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 volume increasing uh, slowly over a long time. So whatever is so we add TPX two, it quickly coats the microtubule, uh, and then um, the the local condensable TPX2 is, is on the microtubule. And so we think that evaporative effects are, are mitigated um, for the process that we're studying. We also just have enough fluid to keep it wet. Okay. Um, so this, um, I, I'll, I'll ask the last question, um, uh, maybe um, uh, along similar lines from Ben Makta. In vivo, I would think the microtubules are growing in roughly constant TPX2. How different is this from sudden addition of TPX2? Um, and that'll be the last question in the interest of time. Yeah, I guess, that, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good question that, that gets at sort of the regulation and the timing of, of these different proteins uh, in the cell. I will say that the TPX2 um, is so, so in the cell biology, so TPX2 is sequestered by a protein complex called uh, important alpha beta. Um, and this, uh, so TPX2 is released from this complex by a gradient of a protein called RAN. So it's a G, RAN is a GTPase that um, is basically, it's, it's concentrated near the chromosomes because um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the protein that adds the third phosphate on the RAN GTP is localized to chromatin. And so, you know, I, I mean, this is, a, this is an open question, but I think a, a decent explanation is that after the, the nuclear envelope dissolves, um, TPX2 is then released from uh, this protein complex important near the chromosomes right away. And then that leads to, to the, the nucleation of these branched microtubules. Um, but the, you know the exact details of the timing of the release of TPX2 and, and branching in the cell is 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 you know worth exploring more. Great, thanks a lot for all the questions and discussion. There's a few more that you can feel free to answer in the chat or in the spatial chat room later on. Thanks again, Sagar, for a fantastic talk. Thank and um, we will go on to our third speaker of the morning. Um, so the third speaker is Hao Yan. And uh, I wanted to mention, I just found out that he's a newly minted PhD. Uh, he just defended uh, his thesis, congrats, Hao. And uh, looking forward to hearing your talk about dynamics of loop extruding polymers. So go ahead and share your screen and tell us about your work. Uh, okay, thanks, Akira. Uh, okay, so um, I'm Hao uh, from the physics department at Yale University. And um, today I will talk about the dynamics of loop extruding polymers. Um, so in eukaryotic cells, uh, DNA is packaged into a complex macromolecular structure called chromatin. So the spatial organization and folding of chromatin within the nucleus can determine the genome functions. And uh, chromatin organization is closely related to its dynamics. Um, it is found that a special organization called topologically associated domain is a fundamental structure of chromatin. So each chromosome occupies a territory within the interface nucleus and they can be further divided into topological domains. Uh, these domains are classified on the basis of the DNA interaction frequencies. So within the domain, the regions frequently interact with themselves, but the regions in different domains have much lower in, uh, interaction frequencies. So such test structure has been found in a wide range of organisms. Uh, to answer the question, how tests arise, the loop extrusion factor model provides an explanation. So the SMC complexes include a family of proteins such as um, cohesin and condensin, 
in this model, they can be simplified as a pair of uh, connected loop extruding factors. So after they bind to the DNA, they can translocate around the DNA to extrude loops until they are stopped by uh, boundary elements such as CTCF. So uh, an SMC can bring a pair of distant loci to be close and make contacts. So a loop can also disappear when the SMC fall off. Um, so these are the basic assumptions of this left model. Uh, because the left model assumes uh, loop extrusion by SMCs requires ATP, an attractive possibility is that uh, SMC activity underlies ATP-dependent chromatin motion. So loss of SMC function is expected to dampen chromatin dynamics. Collaborating with the biology group, we developed a live cell imaging and a tracking approach to characterize the spatial and temporal dynamics of chromatin loci. So through the mean square displacement analysis, we observed a subdiffusive behavior in fishing yeast. Um, however, when we disabled SMC function by employing temperature sensitive mutations of the SMC loading factors, the MSDs are not lowered. Instead, they are elevated and the diffusion coefficients increase. Uh, so this finding is kind of surprising given the assumption of the existing left model. And this is observed in different loci, for example, MMF1, uh, PFL5, and many others. So these observations suggest that SMCs actually constrain the chromatin motion and they are not required for uh, ATP dependent chromatin mobility. So in order to uh, study how loop extrusion influences chromatin dynamics, we couple the loop extrusion outputs to a ROS chain simulation. So ROS model is known as a simple polymer model in dilute solution and short chain melts. So in the ROS model, the polymer is divided into beads that are connected with um, imaginary springs. So each bead experiences a fluid uh, frictional force and a random force. So the equation of motion is given here. Uh, in Ross model, uh, non-local interactions that are distant from the backbone are uh, neglected. And for convenience, we use the matrix expression and apply a normal mode analysis to solve the homogeneous equation. And by matrix diagonalization, we derive the eigenvalues. Uh, its physical meaning is the inverse of the relaxation time of the polymer system. Um, we then move forward to take the stochastic process into consideration. So the normal modes follow a continuous Markov process with non-relaxation time and diffusion constant. Uh, in order to simulate the normal modes, we observe that um, as long as the initial position is none, the normal mode at a later time, uh, dt, is just a linear combination of R0 and the Gaussian white noise. So the normal modes at any later time are supposed to be Gaussian. So using this property, we just need to calculate the mean and the variance of the Gaussian for the normal modes. So we derive an update equation. The variance term here can be obtained by using the equipartition theorem. Uh, after that, we convert the coordinates back to the real space. And this method enables us to simulate exact polymer positions without any approximation. So to introduce loops into the ROS model chain, the loops are modeled as additional harmonic bounds between two beads at the left basis. Um, the dynamic matrix kappa A is replaced by kappa A plus L. If beads I and J are connected by an SMC, the far from diagonal terms appear as an additional spring. So we solve for the eigenvalues and eigenmodes numerically. Um, the video here shows the evolution of loops on the polymer. Uh, on the left side, only one pair of, of left is labeled. So it experiences extrusion, uh, stalling, dissociation, and rebinding. And on the right side, all 30 loops are labeled. So we then explore the chromatin dynamics by uh, mean square displacement. Uh, we perform the simulations in two different organisms, fishing yeast and mouse. So the time scale of the polymer and the bead sizes are a little bit different. In the ROS regime, the MSD for unlooped polymer chain has a time dependence uh, of t to the one half. So the MSDs are plotted with the red lines in the figures. 
uh, we then perform the simulations with loops. Apparently, the averaged MSDs for looped polymer are lower than both fishing yeast and the mouse. So these insights show the snapshots of the polymer in the simulations. Um, the polymer's with loops have a smaller radius of gyration. So we then use a moving window to calculate the effective exponent alpha of the MSDs. And as expected, the effective alpha without loop is close to one half over two decades of time. But in contrast, the effective alpha with loops decline to smaller values. And this result is um, highly consistent with the experiment. The experimental uh, MSDs in fishing yeast have a time dependence of 0.44, which is smaller than an ideal ROS polymer. So our simulation results confirm the fact that the existence of loops constrains chromatin mobility. To have a better understanding how loops affect MSDs, we also performed simulations with static loops. So we randomly take several uh, loop configurations and keep them unchanged in the ROS polymer simulation. We monitor the MSDs of beads at different locations. So for reference here, the red curve is the ROS chain without loop and the blue curve is the average the MSD with loops. So first we find that the MSDs of bead in the middle of the backbone and in the middle of the loops are similar. They're plotted as the black lines. So they overlap with the red MSDs uh, uh, for short time, but at longer times they deviate and become lower than the red MSD. The next we check the beads close to the left feet. The yellow curves represent their MSDs. So interestingly, they are much lower than uh, the other MSDs at all times. So these trends are clearly demonstrated by the effective alpha as well. So through the study of static loops, um, we conclude that loops have a larger effect on the motion of the beads close to the left feet. In other words, um, left, uh, left loops put additional constraint to the nearby regions. So lastly, we also investigate how the number of lefts influence polymer mobility. We input different numbers of lefts into the system. So we find that the MSD uh, the MSD is decreased as more lefts are introduced. Um, this is because more lefts can extrude more portions of the chromatin into loops. We also compare the MSDs for dynamic and static loops. Um, on average, the MSDs with dynamic loops are higher than the MSDs with static loops. So the reason is that the loop extrusion activity can add more mobility to the chromatin. And this is also in agreement with the experiments. So to sum up, our findings imply that uh, left loops largely reduce chromatin mobility. So in the left model, SMC activity is more likely um, ATP independent, and the loop extrusion activity may require other components to be the motor, for example, um, RNA polymerase or nucleosome remodeler. And our simulation results are consistent with the experiment. So this work is in um, collaboration with uh, other groups. So I want to express my thanks to everyone who contributed in this project. And I also appreciate the support from the funding sources. Uh, so thanks for attention. I can take any questions. Great. Thank you, Hal, for a great talk. And uh, the floor is open for questions. Let's see. Uh, just monitoring the chat or Again, uh, welcoming questions first from students and postdocs. Any questions? So there is a question from Lior. Uh, did you consider the ZIM model? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in ROS model, we do include the uh, hydrodynamic uh, effects. So uh, I know in ZIM model, uh, there will be some additional uh, hydrodynamic effects. But in our project, we, we didn't take that into consideration. OK. Um, there's a second question from Atreya Dey. What is the step size of the loop extrusion? Uh, so 
Yes, the step size. Uh, so first we did a loop extrusion simulation and then uh, we use the output from the loop extrusion simulation uh, into the polymer simulation. So in the first uh, step of the loop extrusion, uh, the step size is kind of based on uh, several considerations. First, in the loop extrusion, we want to um, did the simulation and uh, produce a simulated high C map that, uh, that is similar to the experimental high C. Uh, so the resolution of that simulation determines the step size. And the resolution um, considers the coolant lens and uh, the uh, efficiency of the computation time. And uh, so we choose the step size based on those considerations. Okay, thanks. Uh, other questions? We can uh, have questions from faculty and then come back to further questions from students. And again, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, there's a question from Gordon Berman. Can you comment on the differences in chromatin accessibility as a function of number of loops? Uh, chromatin accessibility as a function of number of loops. Uh, so, so uh, with small loops, I think, uh, so more loops can extrude um, more chromatin, uh, more lefts can extrude more chromatin into loops and uh, in that process, I think it determines on what kind of components are included. So if SMC um, cooperate with other components, for example, um, RNA polymerase, so RNA polymerase can do uh, chromatin remodeling and uh, increases the chromatin accessibility to some um, other, compo uh, other factors. So more loops will increase the chromatin accessibility, I think. Okay. Thank you. Um, and oh. then, thank you. And then perhaps the last question in the interest of time um, about, uh, this is a question from Antonio Oliveira about your model. What are the resolution when compared with high C maps? Uh, yeah, so uh, we simulate in two different organisms. In, in the mouse genome, the resolution is uh, 10 KB. Uh, if we convert to the real physical coordinates, it's about uh, 200 nanometer. And in Palm B, the resolution is uh, 500 base pair. And uh, it's kind of similar to uh, like 10 nanometer. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, thanks again, Hal for a really interesting talk and thanks for the questions and discussions. With that, I would like to hand over the moderator duties um, to Gordon Berman for the next uh, half, next to Can I interrupt Thanks, real quick? Sure, Margie. Um, could I get everybody to turn on their video real quick so I can do some screenshots of our group picture for the meeting? Margie, I didn't do my makeup this morning. I'm so sorry. I, I think that the picture will be small enough in the annual report that no one will ever know. <laughs> we need your video also. Oh, yeah. My bad. All right. Aston, do you want to be on video? He may have stepped away. Oh, no. <laughs> I think the answer is no. All right. He's in secret. All right. It's nice to see all of y'all. Yes. Yeah. And I will ask everybody to stay on just very, very briefly right after the last talk. That's some special announcements. Very brief.
Is the diversity discussion happening after the spatial chat speaker thing or before? Um, and currently, I would say. I think, yeah, I, I don't think the speaker, I don't, ex, I don't know if everyone would like to stay and talk about planning the meeting. So I think you can go back and forth. Um, so I'm, it's, I don't think it'll take a long time to ask speaker questions. It's up to y'all. I would say just get it both started and people can hop. Yeah, I, I think it would be good to have the discussion right after the last talk because, you know, yeah. hopping in and out will make it. And then um, people can still go to the spatial chat to ask questions after that. I want to know if Jose is in an airplane or a car. I can't decide. He's in a car, I thought. He's in a car. I was hoping for car. Yes, I'm in the car. I would have been more impressed with an airplane. <laughs> I don't know how my connection will survive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gordon, take it away. All right, sounds good. Okay, so for our uh, for our uh, finishing up on the home stretch here, we have two more talks. Uh, in the sort of rough area of dynamical systems and networks. And so for our first talk, and I apologize if I mispronounce your first name, uh, so please correct me. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Shivham Tripathi. He's coming, from us from, uh, coming to us from Northeastern University, and he'll be talking about networks regulating sulfate choice that are minimally frustrated. So take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Hi everyone. So today I will be talking about a special, uh, a very special property of biological, uh, of biological networks that that are involved in the regulation of cell fate choice. Uh, so we all know that multicellular organisms are composed of different types of cells. Uh, the, uh, these cells can be categorized on the basis of their biological function, uh, on the basis of their morphological features, or on the basis of whether they can give rise to cells of other types. Now, all these different types of cells are, are ultimately arise from a single cell, and the different cell fates can actually be organized in a hierarchical fashion. And as you can see that each branch point in this hierarchy corresponds to the choice between two distinct cell, uh, corresponds to a choice between two distinct cell fates. Now, um, uh, uh, making the right choice is a very important process during, not only during development, but also in adult, uh, but also in, in adult organisms. Uh, so the choice between the, between the different cell fates at each branch point is regulated by gene regulatory networks. Uh, so here I have shown three, uh, I have shown three different examples. And in each case, the network is composed of transcription factors which either activate or, uh, or, or inhibit the expression of different transcription factors and, uh, and and of the various proteins. Uh, and from a dynamical systems point of view, one can simulate the dynamics of, of these networks and find out the different stable states. And the stable states of these networks can then be mapped to the different distinct cell types uh, in each scenario. So uh, once uh, when uh, go, go, uh, so once one, st one starts using uh, the framework of dynamical systems to explain the different cell fates, uh, we encounter a, a paradox which is very similar to the Leventhal paradox in protein folding in that uh, all the networks that are, uh, all the three networks and in general, the gene regulatory networks are large and very complex. And we know that such large and complex networks can exhibit a very large number of stable states. However, the number of different cell types that is seen in multicellular organisms is much smaller. 
Uh, so uh, how do how how can the number of stable states that is exhibited by these networks be restricted? There are two straightforward uh, ways of doing this. So either the network parameters which are governing the network dynamics can be fine tuned, or the network can be exposed to a very specific sequence of signals so that only a small fraction of the possible stable states are exhibited. However, in both these scenarios, the, uh, the self-fate choice is going to be very sensitive to both intrinsic and extrinsic noise, and that's a big no-no in biology. So uh, we wanted to ask uh, if there are other properties of these biological, of these biological, of these networks that allows them to exhibit only the stable states that, uh, that correspond to the cell type seen in multicellular organisms. So, uh, so to understand this, we started with analyzing the dynamical behavior of these networks within a Boolean modeling framework. So, within this framework, each node which corresponds to a which corresponds to a gene. So, the each node can either be plus one if that particular gene is expressed, or it can be minus one if the gene is not expressed. Uh, and the regulatory interactions between the nodes are specified by a matrix J. So Jij is plus one if node J activates node I. It is minus one if node J if node J is inhibiting node I, and it is zero in all other scenarios. Uh, and once we have these uh, once we have the uh, once we have these definitions, we can simulate the dynamics of the of the network using this equation, which uh, which would remind uh, some folks of. Uh, the behavior of a zero temperature sp uh, spin glass on an uh, on a graph. So the general idea about this equation is, is that if the sum of activating inputs to a node is more than the sum of in, of the of the inhibiting inputs, then the node will turn on. Otherwise, it will turn off. So once uh, uh, so seeing that uh, seeing the analogy with spin glasses, uh, we can think about defining a frustration for the different states of the network. So uh, the frustration for a uh, for uh, for a network state is defined as the fraction of edges for which j i j s i s j is less than uh, is less than zero, uh, and what this means is that if uh, if uh, it, uh, is that that particular state of the network is not satisfying the constraints that are being imposed by that particular edge. So we find so in a given state we find uh, what uh, for, uh, we find the fraction of edges for which the constraints are not being satisfied, and that is defined as the frustration of that network state. Uh, so uh, with uh, with the uh, with this framework uh, with this framework uh, we, uh, we we can start uh, we can start uh, we can start looking at the stable states of different biological networks. So we looked at five different uh, we looked at five different cases, uh, and in each case, we calculated the the frustration of the stable states of biological networks and compared the stable uh, and compared this frustration with the frustration in the stable states of random networks to figure out if there is if these biological networks behave in a in a very different way or they are just one among the population of random networks. So we uh, so we observed that in each of the five cases. Uh, the biological uh, uh, the biological uh, uh, in each of the five cases we see that the biological network has some stable states has stable states which have frustration comparable to the frustration of the stable states of random networks uh, so the green is for the random networks the blue is for the biological network uh, however in each case we also observe that the biological network has some stable states as is seen here 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 and so on uh, has some stable states that have very low frustration, and in fact, when uh, when we simulated the dynamics of the biological network starting from uh, starting from random initial conditions, we observed that most of the time we end up in one of the in one of these low frustration stable states, which we call minimally frustrated. So, uh, so it seems that the dynamics of the biological networks are dominated by these low frustration uh, stable states or minimally. Or the minimally frustrated stable states, and that uh, led us to believe that it uh, that it is these minimally frustrated states that may be biologically significant. So to uh, so to understand how these minimally frustrated states are are, are organized, 
we looked at the distribution of the overlap between these minimally frustrated states and observed that the, the that the that the distribution is bimodal uh, with with peaks at plus one and minus one as is is shown by the blue histogram. Uh, so uh, what this implies is that the minimally frustrated stable states can easily be divided into two different groups. Uh, into two different groups and the, that is really good because then we can try and map the two different groups to the two distinct cell fades which we uh, which uh, the uh, the choice between which the network is regulating uh, so this uh, so uh, to uh, to show that this is true we looked at the gene expression patterns in the stable states with different frustration levels so as you can see here uh, so these are the two group uh, these are the states that are minimally frustrated. And we observed that these minimally frustrated stable states have the gene expression pattern of either epithelial cells or of mesenchymal cells. So here we are looking at the 72 node EMT network. So the, uh, so the epithelial fate and the mesenchymal fate are the two canonical cell types that are seen uh, in biology. And it shows that the minimally frustrated states correspond to these canonical cell types. The same behavior is observed for the stem for another network, the stem cell network, where the minimally frustrated states correspond to either a stem cell phenotype or a differentiated cell phenotype. Uh, so uh, this suggests that uh, biological networks uh, have, have some states that have very low frustration and it is these low frustration states that correspond to the canonical cell types seen in biology. The question then is, what about the stable states which have very high frustration here and here? So uh, we observed that in these high frustration stable states, the gene uh, these high frustration uh, these high frustration stable states have an ambiguous gene e expression behavior in the sense that they express features of both the, of both the self fed choices. So, for example. In the EMT case, we, we observed that these high frustration stable states have expression profiles of both epithelial and mesenchymal cells. And in the case of the stem cell network, these uh, uh, high frustration states have features of both stem and differentiated cells. So these kind of cells with an ambiguous phenotypic state are rarely seen in biological tissue. Uh, so they are not usually relevant in, uh, uh, in healthy cells. However, these kind of cells are fairly common in, uh, however, these kind of cells with ambiguous behavior are fairly common in cancer. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the probability of observing these high frustration states can be increased by either increasing the noise in the network dynamics or by adding mutations to the network. And both noisy network dynamics and the, the accumulation of mutations are features that are commonly seen in cancer cells and across cancer types, suggesting that uh, maybe this is the reason why these uh, the, why uh, cells with ambiguous fate choice corresponding to high frustration states of regulatory networks are commonly seen in cancer uh, and not in healthy tissue because in in healthy tissue for, for one you don't have mutations and the and for the other, the noise in the dynamics in healthy tissue is, uh, is much lower as compared to cancer cells. Uh, so uh, till now we have argued that, uh, uh, that the occurrence of these minimally frustrated stable states differentiates biological networks from random networks uh, and, that, uh, uh, and, that these minimal, and that these minimally frustrated states correspond to the canonical cell types. So the question then is how uh, how easy or how hard is it for a population of random networks to evolve these biological features? And by biological feature, I mean the occurrence of minimally frustrated stable states that are encountered most of the time when starting from random initial conditions. So to uh, to test this, we we carried out a simulation of Darwinian evolution, starting with a population of random networks. And, and at each generation, we, uh, we simulate the network dynamics starting from random initial conditions and look at the frustration of the state we end up in. And the top 5% of the networks at each generation, uh, so these are the, the, uh, these are the, uh, these are the, are the least frustrated networks are carried forward to the next generation. And there is a certain probability with which, uh, 
each network will be uh, will be mutated while creating the next generation. So when we carried out when we carry out the simulation, uh, starting uh, at t equal to zero, uh, where we only have random networks, we see that the frustration is really high. But very soon, very quickly, we observe that the frustration of the states that are exhibited by the networks in, in the population goes down. So here, each color shows an independent run. And uh, so this uh, su suggests that, uh, th that under an appropriate selection pressure, these random networks can easily acquire minimal frustration, which as we have argued before is a property of biological networks. And not only that, if we look at the overlap, at the, at the distribution of the overlap between the states, uh, we observed that changes drastically, starting with a very broad distribution for random networks at t equal to zero and becoming clearly bimodal as time goes on. And this bimodal distribution is once again, as we have shown before, a property uh, that was seen for the biological networks. So, uh, so to put it all together, uh, we have shown that uh, the existence of minimally frustrated stable states is a property that distinguishes biological networks from random networks. And uh, these minimally frustrated states correspond to uh, uh, correspond to the canonical cell types that are seen in healthy biological tissue. And uh, there are scenarios uh, su such as noisy network dynamics as well as mutations that can lead to the emergence of uh, that can lead to uh, cells with high friction stable states, which are commonly seen in cancer. And finally, uh, to support our hypothesis that uh, that minimal frustration is a property uh, that has been selected for in biological networks, we show that it is actually fairly easy under an appropriate selection pressure for random networks to acquire minimal frustration. Uh, so to end, I would like to thank David and Herbie who guided me throughout this entire project and as well as uh, NSF, Rice, and Northeastern for the funding, and IPOLS for giving me this opportunity. And if you're interested, you should check out the preprint, which is now online. Thank you very much. Thanks for a great talk. Um, all right, so again, please, I encourage everybody to ask some questions on the chat. Uh, we have one come in from uh, Shin Li. Uh, and have you considered a weighted network, and how will it influence your results? So we have not considered a weighted network yet. What we have done is we have considered uh, we have considered networks where the rules are more complex. So uh, we have a scenario where you have instead of just uh, plus one and minus one in the J matrix, we have uh, and and all rules, which is uh, uh, something that biologists really uh, really like. And uh, we observe that the behavior is very similar in that the biological networks have minimally physical state. Uh, have minimally pressure to stable states. So that uh, seems to suggest that we would also see the same uh, for weighted networks. The, uh, the bigger question there would be that it would be hard to determine what would be the weight for biological networks. Uh, so it could be very hard to determine from experiments to kind of assign a weight uh, to the different edges. So uh, it's easier to assign logic-based rules, but uh, assigning weights could be hard, which is why we did not do that. Great, uh, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I had a quick one. Uh, there's um, a question, Gordon, oops. the question yes. four. Um, oh, 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 okay, I see. Uh, can you clarify more how topological features contribute to relaxation in the system? And this is coming from R.A. Rosenstein. So, uh, we believe that the uh, so there are different topological features uh, that we look uh, that we looked at. So the first one is uh, uh, is network hierarchy. Uh, so we observed that the that the hierarchy in the random networks and biological networks did not have. So first of all, the hierarchy was very uh, was uh, was similarly distributed, and the, and it, and the hierarchy did not have an effect on the frustration of the stable states that we observed. And the second feature we looked at is the presence of double loops. So a double loop would be where node i has some effect on node j and node j has some effect on node i. And we, and we observed that even if we preserve the number 
of these double loops between biological and random networks, we do not see a difference. We still see that biological networks have a lower frustration. Uh, and then finally, just uh, I think I, I did not uh, I did not mention that during my talk is that when I say random networks, uh, these random networks were uh, were uh, were generated in a special manner in the sense that they have the same uh, they have the same degree distribution and the same number of activating and inhibiting edges as the biological networks. So we so we definitely know for sure that the degree distribution does not have an influence. Um, I guess I had a quick question. Yeah. So one of the um, what, one of the things that people would think a lot, and particularly it's come, uh, see, we've seen a lot of this in a lot of recent neuroscience work, is thinking about or, these types of networks instead of from a perspective of frustration, but a perspective of controllability and reachability. Have you thought at all about those sorts of things? And do you, th how would those, um, how do you feel the frustration would relate to concepts like reachability here? So, uh, uh, how do you? Uh, so, uh, I don't know. I don't. Uh, uh, I don't know how do you define reachability in the context of these networks. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, in the in the context here, basically, I mean, more or less, I had, uh, I was just asking about. Have you thought about maybe just perhaps more broadly? Have you thought about instead of thinking this from a frustration standpoint? Have you thought about this yeah. from a control theory standpoint? Uh, so no, uh, no, we haven't. So uh, we don't. So uh, yeah. So to, I guess that was the first point we, uh, that you mentioned is regarding uh, the controllability of, 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 uh, of point of view. And uh, so we haven't looked at how frustration might tie in, or uh, how the how other topological features may tie in with that uh, feature yet. Uh, so yeah, that's something that we may look at at a later point in time. Okay. Great. Cool. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. All right, well, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank uh, Shivham again, and let's move on to our very last speaker. Uh, and that will be uh, Carlos Floyd, uh, and he'll be coming to us from uh, the University of Maryland. Uh, Carlos, if you could share your screen. Oh, there you are. Sure. And he'll be talking to us about Hessian analysis enables prediction of cytoquake occurrence. So can you all- Take it away. All right. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Floyd. Uh, I do research at the University of Maryland with Garrett Papoyan and Chris Trozinski. And the title of my talk, like Gordon mentioned, is Hessian Analysis Enables Prediction of Cytoquake Occurrence. And this work was done in collaboration with uh, Herbie Levine at Northeastern University. So the first mention of cytoquakes was in this paper in 2016 by Alan Carr and co-authors. In this paper, they placed microbeads on top of cells and attach them through the plasma membrane to the underlying cytoskeleton. And they tracked the movements of these microbeads in the XY plane, and they measured the magnitudes of the displacements of this bead from time point to time point. When they made a histogram of those magnitudes, they found that it had this kind of Gaussian center, but also had these kind of very distinct heady tails that rose above the Gaussian fit. And then in 2019, there was a paper by Yu Shi and co-authors where they placed cells on tops of these uh, flexible micropost arrays and they measured the displacements of these microposts as well. And they found that similarly, um, the histogram of these displacements were characterized by these kind of striking heavy tails. And so in seismology, there's something called the Gutenberg-Richter law, which says that uh, the frequency of an earthquake has a power law dependence on the energy released by that earthquake. And so due to that analogy, Alain Carr coined the term cytoquake to refer to some kind of large sudden event in cytoskeletal dynamics. So one possible biological implication of these earthquake-like dynamics is that in order to responsibly obey different physiological cues, the cytoskeleton might operate close to what's called the edge of chaos, which is a kind of non-equilibrium critical point characterized by scale invariant event sizes. This would allow some kind of small trigger to, to induce a global yet coherent uh, response. And by analogy, we already appreciate that certain components of the cytoskeleton, such as microtubules, exhibit a related phenomenon called dynamic instability. So they'll sometimes undergo these catastrophic depolymerization events. And this can allow them to quickly undergo large changes. And similarly, in the brain, it's been discovered um, that the, the people have discovered these things called neuronal avalanches, which appear as these power law distributions of the numbers of simultaneously firing electrodes that are measured during experiments. And this has been argued to contribute towards brain plasticity and to optimize information processing in the brain. 
But be, uh, because cytoquakes are just a recently discovered phenomenon, then before we can kind of investigate uh, what the possible biological roles that they might play could be, it would be helpful to understand something more about the underlying physics. So that's kind of the broad general goal of, of this research. So in our lab, we developed a software called Median, which you can find out about at this website. And we use it to simulate uh, self-organizing cytoskeletal networks. So today we'll be focusing on a kind of minimal system, this uh, actomyosin network, which consists of the semi-flexible actin filaments shown in red, uh, these green passive cross for example, alpha actinin uh, shown in green here, uh, these uh, myosin motors shown in blue, and these guys will walk along filaments in a directed manner and by doing so generate uh, motion and mechanical forces. So median simulations work by iterating through a cycle of four steps. In the first step, we run a stochastic chemical simulation on a variant of the Gillespie algorithm for a short time delta T. We then compute the new stresses that resulted from the chemical reactions occurring in step one. Then we relax the net forces in the system in a mechanical equilibration phase by minimizing the mechanical energy function. And then finally, we update the reaction rates of certain force sensitive reactions to allow for things like motor stalling. And in previous work, we, impl we implemented a feature into median that allows us to track the uh, change in Gibbs free energy during each of these steps. And in particular, we looked at the net change of the system's mechanical energy across this entire cycle. And we found that it had this kind of distinct non-Gaussian shape characterized by these heavy tails. So in our 2019 paper, we argued that these heavy tails might be indicative of some kind of avalanche-like processes, but we didn't really pursue it much in detail then. Uh, but today our focus will be primarily on the heavy tails of these mechanical energy fluctuations. So here's a trajectory of the system's mechanical energy U as it self-organizes. We see that after around 1,000 seconds, it reaches its quasi-steady state. And if we zoom into this trajectory, we see that from time point to time point, the energy will sometimes decrease by these very large amounts shown in blue here. And occasionally it will also increase by these large amounts shown in green. So we plotted the uh, distributions of these negative and positive increments. So here we're showing the complementary cumulative distribution function. A, uh, the y value on this curve tells you the probability of observing a value with a random variable that's greater than the corresponding x value. And so for comparison, we tried to fit these curves with these half normal CCDFs but we see that the tails are much heavier than predicted by this Gaussian fit. And instead, they're fit well by these shifted power laws, which have this form here. And by comparing the fit parameters for these positive and negative increments, we can conclude that the negative increments where delta U is less than zero have much shallower, i.e. heavier tails, as well as an earlier onset of power law behavior than the positive increments. So this supports the picture that energy accumulation occurs comparatively slowly and is then released in these large cytoplate-like events. So we next looked at the displacement of the filaments during different types of cycles. We considered cycles in which delta U was less than negative 100 kBT, when it was between negative 100 and zero kBT, and so on. And what we see is that for the cytoquake events, which we define as when delta U is less than negative 100 kBT, the total filament displacement is much greater than in any other cycle type. And furthermore, this does not result from some kind of highly localized motion, but instead involves many filaments each displacing a large amount. So to check this, we ranked each of the 50 filaments in our simulations by the displacement that they experienced during the cycle. And we uh, plotted that rank against the corresponding displacement. And we see that the cytoquake curve in blue sits entirely above the rank displacement curve for all their cycle types. So this means that during cytoquakes, every filament is, is typically moving greater than the typical, greater than the usual amount. And so it really does mean kind of a large global restructuring of the network. So we can compare this result to some recent work done by our colleagues at Rice. So if you saw James Lyman's uh, very nice talk on Monday, then you might be familiar with this. Um, they studied the difference between branched and unbranched networks, and they found that by adding ARP23. And they found that in branched networks, they would occasionally see these kind of very large shifts in these global shape parameters, such as the radius of gyration. And they didn't tend to see that in the um, unbranched networks. And so here we are seeing some kind of large movements in our simulations of unbranched networks, but we don't see things quite as dramatic as uh, these large shifts that they noticed. And so I was talking with James a little bit about this, and we think that one way to maybe um, think about it is that branching acts to enhance some kind of already inherent avalanche-like dynamics in actomyosin networks, um, but that the avalanche-like dynamics does not solely rely on, on branching to exist. And it could enhance that by introducing additional mechanical constraints on the filaments at the branching point, and also by reducing the mean length of the filament, which uh, makes them act uh, less flexibly. 
And so it'll be interesting to kind of continue to see how that works. So to go further, we implemented a feature into Median that allows us to construct the Hessian matrix of the system's mechanical, of the system's mechanical energy U. So uh, as a reminder, this is a matrix that contains mixed second derivatives of U with respect to the 3N mechanical degrees of freedom that comprise our network. So it's given by this form here. It's also given as the uh, negative the derivative of these force components with respect to these uh, mechanical degree of, degrees of freedom. And in median, it's possible to numerically compute these derivatives. So this is how we construct this matrix. We're interested in the Hessian matrix because the eigenvalues of H will tell you about the local curvature and the stability at that point in the energy landscape. Um, and so in single molecule nuclear dynamic studies, it's known that conformational transition states of molecules correspond to saddle points in the energy landscape, characterized by some negative eigenvalues of, of the Hessian matrix. And so similarly, um, it's possible that before we have a cytoquake, there's some kind of signature in the Hessian eigenspectrum that tells us that a large structural rearrangement is poised to occur. So um, each of the eigenmodes of the Hessian matrix is a vibrational normal mode of the network. Uh, we visualized one here. Um, each one of these corresponds to an eigenvalue, which is the stiffness of that mode. And we also use these metrics called the inverse participation ratio, RK. This tells you how many mechanical degrees of freedom are involved in that vibrational motion. So in this one, we see that it involves quite a few degrees of freedom. We plotted the density of states, which is shown as this uh, solid line here. Um, and we see that it has this kind of interesting twin peaked structure. So we defined a threshold at 40 peak newtons per nanometer to distinguish between what we call these stiff modes and these soft modes. And we also plot on top of this the ratio data as a scatter plot. And what we see is that these soft modes uh, have much higher values of RK, so that we have this picture that um, there are these soft, very delocalized motions of the network, as well as these uh, stiff, much more highly localized um, vibrational motions. So we next projected the movements of the network during each cycle onto the eigenmodes. So D is a three dimensional vector that tells you kind of how each bead has moved during that cycle. And DK is the component of that motion along the kth eigenmode. Uh, D and VK are both normalized. So the sum of these DK squared will be equal to one. And we use that as weights to introduce this uh, metric called the effective stiffness or the projection weighted eigenvalue. So this is just a weighted sum over the, all, all the eigenvalues with the weights given by these projection weights dk squared. And we made a scatter plot of um, the effective stiffnesses and the delta u for all the cycles at quasi steady state. Uh, so if we would marginalize over this new thing lambda p, we would recover the same kind of asymmetric heavy tail distribution of delta u that we were discussing earlier. But in this representation, we have some more information. And what we see is that left of the cytoquake line, uh, at negative 100 kBT, there is a concentration of probability of the effective stiffness below the soft stiff, uh, the soft, stiff threshold. Um, and so cytoquakes, um, as a result of this analysis, we think that cytoquakes have enhanced displacement along the soft modes. Or kind of to anthropomorphize the network, we could say that in order to kind of have these big structural rearrangements, this, the network wants to take the path of least resistance by deforming primarily along the soft modes. So finally, we wanted to see if we could actually predict when cytoquakes were, were about to occur, given instantaneous information about the Hessian eigenspectrum at time t. So for this, we implemented a machine learning model, this three-layer feed-forward neural network that takes in the Hessian eigenspectrum here and outputs the probability p that a cytoquake will occur in the next couple of simulation cycles. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but from this, we learned that you can make this kind of prediction. And the information that is relevant is contained in the soft part of the Hessian eigenspectrum. And if you also add the energy at time t u, then you can do even better prediction. So we say that the soft delocalized modes and the energy reflect some measure of instability in the network that precedes cytoquake occurrence. So kind of the takeaway from this talk is that there's some signature in the soft part of the Hessian eigenspectrum that precedes cytoquakes. And during cytoquakes, the network will globally deform along the soft modes to release a large amount of mechanical energy. So we had to condense quite a few results that we did from this work um, for today's talk. If you're interested in this topic, and we have a preprint that's currently available here. It's the same title as uh, this talk. And if you're very interested, you can feel free to email me uh, with any questions or comments that you might have. And so with that, I would just like to thank everyone who helped with this work. Uh, this includes the Papoyan Lab, 
were pictured here back when we didn't have to stand six feet away from each other. Um, I'd like to especially thank my advisors, Garrick and Chris, as well as Herbie for his contributions. Um, I'd like to very much thank the polls that work for putting on this conference and for giving us the opportunity to give these presentations. These simulations were run on Deep Thought 2, which is UMD's local high performance computing cluster. Uh, this work was funded by grants from the NSF. And finally, I'm a member of the Combined Program, which is a NSF funded research traineeship program that emphasizes network science approaches to biological problems. So I'd like to thank them as well. I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and I'd be happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Um, so we have a few questions already posted. So one from uh, Tyler Solners. Uh, did you look at the avalanche duration statistics? And by that, I just mean how many time steps does one of these energy bursts last? Yeah, we did consider how best to define cytoquakes, um, either as like an instantaneous release of energy or one that would persist for a couple of consecutive decreases. We found that it didn't make too much of a difference how we made that distinction. So we didn't really focus on it much. Um, but yeah, we, then you can also look at kind of how long each of those consecutive decreases lasts. And so like in SandPy models, they look at like the duration of these avalanches. Um, we did look at that, but there wasn't too much that was terribly exciting there. So we didn't really kind of um, make a big emphasis on that. Great. Uh, similarly, uh, from uh, Milos Nikolic, uh, to add on to that, have you been able to look at the time scales of the hard versus soft modes and are they different? The time scales of the nodes. Um, so you can define a frequency of each of these, which will just be, I think, given by the square root of the stiffness. Um, so I think these soft modes will have a, a longer time scale in that language. Um, but that should just be contained in the same, it's, it's the same kind of representation as we have here. So um, we didn't look at that too specifically, no. And Thank you. And from uh, Shin Lee, actin filament is an active polymer, which means it, it can constantly assembles and disassembles itself. Did you consider this effect? Also, could the cytoquake phenomenon be induced just by the break of the filament? So yeah, there is an active polymerization process that does contribute some kind of driving to the network. We look at these at quasi steady state when the polymerization is and depolymerization is kind of at a net balance. So we don't think that's like a main contributor. It's mainly coming from the myosin. Um, and we also don't have severing in our simulation. So what we're seeing is not a result of some kind of filament breaking, but in the cell, that could be a possibility. Uh, and from Xu Xiao uh, Song, uh, is the cytoquake related to tissue formation at all? I'm not sure. Um, I think it's a new, it's a very new kind of idea and there's a lot of kind of biological relevance that need to be explored. So I, I can't say for sure about that. Thanks. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, rather uh, give a chance to PI is a chance to ask a couple of questions. So, uh, so Margaret Chung, I think had a question. So if you wanted to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you so much, Carlos. This is a wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to comment also um, following up James work. Uh, my group also have another student, uh, Chen Xuan, to vary the up to three concentration to look at the cytoquake. And we realized that, you know, by varying the concentration of ARP23, we can actually uh, tune the amplitude of the avalanche. So this is something that perhaps we can continue and take a look at it yeah. since we're working all in the same direction or similar direction. Yeah, I agree. I think that's definitely a very strong candidate for how the cell might be able to tune this um, behavior to suit different kinds of needs is by modulating the ARP23 concentration. Great. Well, uh, as there are no other questions, uh, let's all thank Carlos again. And let's thank all of the speakers who have done a great job throughout all of the last few days, giving a bunch of great talks. I've had a lot of fun. And I think so now, and now let's probably, are we handing it over to Dan now? Yes, I just very briefly want to again, thank everybody who participated and, and bore with us during this chaotic, uh, organization and uh, much, much thanks for, for rolling so nicely. Uh, of course, I want to thank uh, the leads of iPulse, uh, our, our funding agency. Uh, goes without saying, this could not have happened without them. I would also like to thank the 
local, I will put in quotes, organizing committee. Uh, um, Margie Dieter, of course, uh, was incredible in getting this to, uh, to happen. And I think we should give her a huge round of applause, virtual and, uh, and, and physical. And please feel free to send her me uh, emails uh, thanking her. Um, I also want to thank the incredible team at Georgia Tech. Uh, first, I'll start with Aaron McCaskey, who's an undergraduate at Georgia Tech, who was responsible for actually getting the website going and getting the schedule up and just did a terrific job, as well as the folks at Georgia Tech in our administration, uh, uh, including Mari Gorda, uh, including Gary Longstreet, Tara Davis, and Nicole Thompson, who helped get all of this organized. And I should say, also helped organize the previous version of this meeting, which was physical. I will say there was no uh, small amount of work that went into getting the previous version going, which we ultimately scrapped and, and moved to this virtual version. So thanks to all of them. I told them to pop on. I don't know if they did, um, but if not, uh, I will thank them whenever I see them again in person. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Appreciate everybody's time and patience and terrific talks and I enjoyed it. And now I'd say we can uh, move on to the the speaker chat and or the uh, chat on the next meeting moving forward. Do y'all need the link again for the spatial chat room? Sure, might as well send it. All right, let me go find it. If you would like to stay and talk about planning the meeting, um, then that would be awesome. All right, I can't, I am doing dope. Let's see, there we go. That's not. Yeah, I'll have to go, but um, when is the meeting? The meeting to talk about, we're going to talk about planning the um, diversity and inclusion meeting. All right, but I mean, when, when are you planning to have it? When are we intending to hold it? Right. Um, I would think probably sometime this fall. Another picked her up and carried her back to the middle. In person or Zoom? She waved as if to rock us. That's a good question. Depends, depends if we can, Creston. We never know what's going to happen. That's what I'm saying. So, so I mean, I. Yeah. The feeling is we're going to put a committee now, and they are going to evaluate all the possibilities. But we want to make sure the students participate and all that. So that's yeah, the point of the discussion. And we really want the students to be part of planning. Yes. It's not a faculty plan meeting. <laughs> And I've already gotten some emails from students who are interested, and I've directed them towards Margie. Yeah, I, I, I think okay. faculty should have also a role. I mean, the students are students, but yeah, well, but it's not all organized by the faculty. Sure, I mean, we we work fifty years, forty years of our lives to get where we are. They they have for some time to go. Yes, for sure. But they have more energy than faculty we do. will clearly be involved, <laughs> but they still just. No, everybody should be involved. I, I don't think it's, I, I don't feel that because I'm, you know, in the middle of my life, I suddenly am less worth it than somebody. No, no, no. <laughs> Kristen, what we want to make sure is the faculty is <laughs> always involved. We want to make sure the students are part of it. That's yeah. what of course, sure. absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Everybody make sure. should, that's why I said everybody. I didn't say one of exactly. you. Exactly, exactly. So we, now we want to just make sure that we got enough students so it's not become a faculty only thing. It becomes really the entire community. Right. You know, we, I mean, we will. So let me say one thing, uh, and that is that uh, I will be very happy to provide the resources for such a meeting. Yeah, I guess the question of whether it's in person or or online has right. a very large effect on the needed resources, and it's right. but, sort but of very hard to you know, very hard to know that right now. I understand, but I'm just saying that uh, you know. 
you will have the resources for whatever happens. Okay. So we have we had planned a uh, faculty mentor, even though it's, meant it's uh, organized by students, I'd be happy to provide the experience and mentor the students to organize. I volunteer. Yeah. Margaret, that's what we were. In fact, that uh, the when I was listening to you the other day, uh, it occurred to me that you are an excellent person to help out in this for sure. Oh, thank you. I would uh, do my best and <laughs> share my experience and yeah. train the the young people to um, recognize the problem and find creative solutions. And also, so, I, I would like to, because I really have to go, but I, I would really uh, suggest that uh, students and faculty, that we engage people that are actually not part of the network and people that we don't know now, but actually that we go much broader in uh, participation in that meeting. Yes, I have a few uh, people I've been talking to, talking with uh, from um, through DBIO, through APS, through diversity program. So there, there are resources that to help us learn. So we are not reinventing the wheels. Yeah, I, I think Margaret is is, is 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 the right person to do this. Not only because. First of all, she has direct experience, but also she's very much tied into the APS as a sort of, you know, D-Bio. I forget exactly where, where in, the, in the chain of command you are right now. I'm the vice chair. I mean, the problem is chair. that, but, uh, you, yeah. the, the problem is that just one person will not be sufficient to do it, so. No, 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 but she can be the one who, who organizes. I think the other thing is we need to set up some uh, way other than just this discussion of students that and postdocs and who can directly contact Margaret and say I'm interested, you know, and, and, and we will support that. We will support her and everything. Yeah. Margaret will support everybody. Support. Yeah. She's just going to lead it. She's just going to be the lead. You know, uh, you know, leading the leading help. cell. Well, uh, in the collective Herbie, motion. Herbie, yes, remember in our polls proposal, we already had planned an NSF education meeting on diversity to be held at Fisk. Oh, yes, I understand that. Uh, in connection with the now virtual BPS. Right. Yes. So um, I that was going to be February next year. And I was hoping that could stay on site. But uh, I, I'm not sure doing if we do it in the fall, it's going to have to be virtual. And this meeting was so successful. I think we should always keep up a virtual component yes. of every meeting we so have. We all Jose, are you trying to say something? <laughs> uh, I guess. Yeah, I, I totally agree about the virtual yeah. part. Yeah, well, I think we've already. We, everybody, I think I've ever talked. I've talked to this week has said that that's we should definitely do that. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> do we have some students on the who are still here who have thoughts and? ideas that they'd like to share? Well, <clears throat> as you know, uh, Charlene had to go off and teach uh, to the virtual summer school for the FIS students. So she has uh, was the one making the plan for the education meeting next February. So I was going to nominate her to work with Margaret. Uh, you know, Margaret has unique uh, experience given the location in, in Houston. And I, I know also that Charlene has worked with the BPS on education. So I think it will, uh, there'll be a good team. Okay, I sound that's great. Maybe each node uh, can nominate a person so we can have a wide cast. Uh, particularly, I think Atlanta is unique, has a large uh, African American um, mm -hmm. population. I just noticed it's hard to see from the screen. But uh, students from the black um, physicist uh, community is not um, fully represented here. So perhaps we can reach out to them. And remember, and remember, let me just interrupt Margie because Margie, I think sent a note to some of the, this meeting was essentially organized at last minute. And the idea was only folks from uh, the nodes already in iPulse for this, this particular meeting. That yeah. moving forward is a very different situation. I, I understand, but we are talking about planning for the next one. Correct. Right? Which means that if the Atlanta, the Georgia Tech or Emory could have a 
uh, represent representative that can help us expand. For sure. You know, for, for sure. I'm not talking about this one. Sure, and you know, at, at, at a local level, Georgia Tech has very strong interactions and programs with the HBCUs, you know, around here. So this is not an issue, and we already have several. Anyway, we will we will have certainly representation from Georgia Tech to help out. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I already. Um, um, like to initiate a conversation with Margaret, for example, but but I'll be happy to uh, help connect with uh, institutes here in the DC and Maryland area. I think that's, that's important. Great. And we have like a- um, Yeah, there's Harvard University. University community and multiply the impact of our network to reach out to the students that doesn't be, haven't attended this uh, meetings before. I think probably the goal is to be a little bit more inclusion inclusive. Yeah. And I guess my first question is, are you planning to target more the undergraduate community as well as the graduate community or uh, in this diversity meeting? I, I think uh, we feel that it's important to even go one step younger if possible, like definitely the undergraduate, if not the high school, if, if we can. I think the advantage of talking with undergraduates is that um, you can have, you know, it, it might, if there's a mentoring program like the FIS program or some other kind of program that it, it, it could help increase, that might help increase diversity in graduate school more effectively than talking to grad students. Yes. So Very much so. Yes. Yes. And Margaret, our FIS trainees this year is a good group to get involved. Yes, yes. Um, I'm, not so sure, I'm not so sure if they are here today. But no, I could, why do we talk to them later, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I could no, do I... is that we, we have a very uh, kind of, um, this is uh, the, the eighth year of FIS. Maybe we can invite some of the former FIS fellows who have continued yeah. to grad school to come and you know, give insights and give talks, something like that. Yeah, I think we all believe that probably the biggest problem is the pipeline issue of undergraduates and even high school students it's getting into physics. Uh, that uh, it's not, you know, so the F, so starting with the FIS, you know, the undergraduate level and whether we can do something in high school, I have no idea. It seems much harder uh, for us to, to, for to figure out how to do that. But uh, uh, maybe they're science teachers. Right. Yeah, but uh, I'm just that's just a hard task because there's so many of them and it's such a uh, we can try we can figure we have to have a discussion of what's possible there, not just what we'd like to do. Can we I, don't can I suggest a student. I think Caitlin Knapp and Andre Gasick, these are two students who have a uh, mentoring experience. I would like to invite them to to uh, to join the discussion if you guys are willing to do that. Uh, is there any way we can reach out to younger? I would say reaching out to community college is probably a more effective way because most uh, underrepresented students after high school, they go to community college. So yes. Uh, yes. that was probably- Margaret, I really like that idea. Um, so I'll just put forward that I came up through the community college system. Um, I did my associates at community college before moving to U of H um, and I worked full time to get my way through college. Um, and it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. So um, I definitely fall outside the bounds of what would be considered a traditional student. Um, and I have seen many of my peers um, transfer out of STEM programs or out of college altogether because of many of the issues that I think um, are needed to be discussed now. Now, I will say that um, there was a recent article um, on uh, undergraduate education uh, showing that freshman chemistry is the point at which uh, we lose most underrepresented STEM students along that pipeline. And so I do think there needs to be a discussion with undergraduates uh, regarding uh, those intro chemistry courses, whether it be at community colleges or four-year universities. Um, and I think part of that 
also relates to not only how uh, the general chemistry is being taught and presented, but also how the notion of what it is to be a scientist is projected within those courses. Um, I think that here at Rice, it's actually quite beneficial that we have um, teaching facility, uh, faculty and instructors leading those courses um, because as we know, there are large student bodies and it requires a lot of work. I think that having the inclusion of graduate students in those courses is very key because you're in a demographic close to the undergraduate level and you can actually have more social interaction with people that perhaps look like you or come from backgrounds like you. And it also provides an opportunity for graduate students to offer some sort of mentorship for undergrads, which I think is also necessary along this pipeline, both from high school to undergrad and undergrad to grad school. Um, so I, I would certainly like to hear from other grad students um, at this time to get their perspectives. But I think that there are several points along this uh, leaky pipeline that could be addressed in this meeting. Thank you. I think, John, is John Pickett here? Thank you, uh, Caitlin. Is John Pickett here? You mentioned you want to say something. I didn't know, see your name here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, John, is that you? All right, John, uh, this is John Pickett. Uh, she's, do you want to introduce yourself and then say what you think? You actually compiled quite a good, a uh, lot of uh, data yesterday. And uh, yeah, go, let's say. Let's yeah, I, I agree very strongly with what Caitlin is saying there because I've, I've had similar experiences myself. But introduce yourself first. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm Jonathan Pickett. I recently graduated from University of Houston as well. Um, I've been working with uh, Dr. Chung and uh, Dr. Onacek at, uh, at Rice for the last couple of years. Um, uh, through the FIS program specifically, which uh, I, I don't think Caitlin mentioned it, but she was also in that program. Um, and I feel like programs like that in particular are well adapted and well situated to address this issue of um, minority representation and the gaps that are uh, so apparent in the educational system and the um, uh, amount to essentially systemic racism um, and uh, as as a, as a means to addressing that, I think the as I said, the FIS program is very well uh, equipped and situated for that because it allows the students who are generally not given the same opportunities, whether it's because of uh, just a lack of representation or the the mental aspect of going through college as oftentimes first generation students, uh, which is something I can also. Uh, uh, I have also experienced myself um, or the financial burdens that are um, much more severe now than at any other time in, in the history of our country um, for students um, with, for a number of factors, obviously. But um, for those reasons, I, I agree very strongly with Dr. Chung in that uh, reaching out to students at the community college level uh, is very important because a lot of underrepresented minorities do tend to go to my to uh, community colleges off the bat because it's more affordable and it's easier to get into and when you look at the uh, graduation rates the differences uh, coming out of high school and the uh, test score differences between different races coming out of high school um, you can see a clear correlation there between the number of students going to community college um, but there's a big gap coming out of community college into four-year schools because even though community colleges are more affordable, it's still a problem for a lot of people paying for things. And so individuals like myself and Caitlin, while we take a lot longer than normal to graduate, um, we're persistent and we find the resources needed. Um, in our situations, the FIS program was a huge help, um, but a lot of people aren't aware of those opportunities or don't know um, how to find those resources and so reaching out to those people and letting them know that there are opportunities like that available, um, as well as basic information about uh, financial literacy, which is not common knowledge, um, 
and other information like the fact that grad school for, uh, for the sciences is not something you have to pay for and that you actually get paid as a graduate student. Like I myself didn't know that until after years in, in college. Um, and for the first few years in college, I kind of floundered a little bit because I didn't know uh, that that was an option. And I was thinking of doing something like engineering or, uh, I mean, I really didn't know. Um, it, it changed everything for me once I realized that that was actually an option. So um, I personally would, am, am looking forward to getting involved at that level, reaching out to students at the community colleges, going uh, here in Houston to Houston Community College, uh, maybe Lone Star if we can get them involved, um, and talking to students in the, the freshman physics classes and the freshman chemistry classes about those opportunities and the information that's necessary to be successful at that level and move on to a university and get involved in research um, at an early stage, I feel like that's very, uh, very fundamental and very impactful. So um, I, I definitely, like I said, would, I'm looking forward to getting involved in that end and any, uh, any way we can organize um, other volunteers such as myself to, to do so. Uh, especially at a national level, I, I, I feel like this is a perfect stage to kind of get something like that rolling. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add, agreeing with everything Jonathan said, that it is true both at U of H and even at Rice among undergraduates, there is uh, virtually no knowledge that graduate school for the sciences is paid for. Um, so I don't think it matters necessarily what institution you're coming from. This has not been well advertised across the board. Um, and so obviously many students um, see themselves as going straight into the workforce with a bachelor's degree because they don't see an option or a place for them in higher education. Um, and I would just like to add that um, we need more summer programs um, to get students involved in research that have stipends. I, I know myself, I, I worked every summer and that paid for my fall and spring tuitions. And I know many underrepresented, um, underrepresented students and minorities who are in the same position. And so it's um, the little everyday things that seem not such a big deal uh, when you're on the side of haves and are huge when you're on the side of have nots. <laughs> Okay, Andre Gassick say he want to say something. Thank you, Caitlin. Andre, you, uh, you want to say something? Uh, well, I mean, I totally agree with uh, Caitlin and, and Jonathan. Um, I, I think the main thing that especially uh, is a huge deterrent is, I mean, number one to me is probably financial reasons. Um, like, I mean, it's the main thing is, can you make money as a physicist? I think that's what mm -hmm. would uh, would you know deter a lot of people. I mean, I mean, I think my my parents would always tell me to go to something that makes money and not science. So that's that's um, something that people think that you can't live a life off of science by itself, or you need a lot of help with that. So I mean, I think that's probably the main deterrent that I see, but uh, I'm, I mean, that's just from my point of view. Um, uh, I wanted to say something about that. Uh, th this, um, uh, yeah, this, this problem, th this issue has uh, a very, very long history about communicating, you know, whether people can uh, get jobs in this and what parents think about that. If you uh, look back at the history of the early 20th century, a lot of people that you think of as physicists like or mathematicians like von Neumann, uh, Wigner, Zillard, um, these people all major, all took engineering degrees. 
for the very same reason. Um, I think that this really is um, because there's been so little uh, uh, positive uh, attitude of the society towards uh, scientists that people have, for, have gone back to that old opinion uh, that there was no future in doing science. I think that that's uh, a problem that the um, NSF needs to worry about uh, a, a bit. I think it's really in their uh, bailiwick. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's not a very helpful thing to say, but I'm just saying that this problem goes back to the 20, beginning of the 20th century, so. Um, and, and Peter, I will note actually an interesting uh, sidebar to that, that at Georgia Tech at least, which is, you know, I think now the one of the largest mechanical engineering departments in the country, it's not actually true that, that STEM students, STEM in the E, are uh, fully funded through graduate school. In mm. fact, particularly the master's students, we admit tons of master's students with no funding. And then it is an incredible scramble for them to find money. I happen to advise some engineering students. And so that's another point in favor of physics where we at least in our, in our place offer a few semesters of TA. Uh, but engineering can be a tricky road and uh, with unexpected uh, surprises for these students. Uh, anyway, I actually have to go because of a previous engagement. You know. But uh, from the point of view of the overall program, I think uh, there's an opportunity for funding for other things. If we come up with a reasonable plan for how to proceed and what makes sense, um, you know, actually, we already proposed in, in our renewal uh, exploring how to spread some of the FIS type programs at a more national level. Uh, but that's not the only idea out there. There's many other considerations. So, so uh, I will check in with Margaret uh, later today or, to, or, or over the weekend about what, uh, you know, was, if there was any final outcome. But I think the basic plan to uh, have Margaret serve as the sort of uh, node which receives uh, information about who's willing to participate, which students, which postdocs, what's a, what are some ideas for how to organize this meeting that we then coalesce those ideas over the next couple of weeks for an actual plan. I think uh, as a preliminary way to approach this seems quite uh, sensible. So I'm, um, you know, I think it's great. Okay, that sounds like a good plan, action mm -hmm. plan. So my from UIUC, Arptita from Maryland Node, uh, Bertina from uh, Austin, Greg Morrison, and Jennifer Curtis from Georgia Tech. And students, I have uh, Caitlin, uh, Jonathan, and, and Andre. And I will continue to strip, spread the word and hopefully have some postdoc from other nodes who would like to join. Thank you. Okay. So Margaret, just do the same great job you did on the Gordon Research Conference. Oh, thank you so much. I will do my best. There's um, um, some other student emails. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of volunteer here. I'm very, very moved. Madeline, Abravin, Hannah. Uh, okay, I need to save this list. Yeah, I'll, I'll have the chat notes. To great, great. This is so moving. Margaret, I'm not sure if Zan already uh, talked about um, our proposal for the next education meeting um, and, and hosting that with our colleagues at Fisk University in Nashville, the historically black college in, in Nashville. I just actually came from uh, teaching the students there. Um, we have a, a program, a bridge program with them. And um, so we had proposed to have the next IPULSE education meeting at Fisk in Nashville um, because the Biophysical Society meeting was supposed to be in Nashville. Um, so they sort of threw a wrench in our plans now that they've decided to go virtual for the BPS meeting. Um, but in any case, um, you know, we have a, a strong relationship with FISC um, and also um, the TechJipPa group has a strong relationship with UNBC in Baltimore. And I know that, you know, University of Houston is a- um, this you. We have a partnership with Texas Southern University also. Right. You, yeah. So if I'm wrong, but I, sorry. relationships that we probably already have a lot of those relationships within the network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I believe the next March meeting is in Nashville. 
And so that could potentially be an opportunity for engagement as well. Yeah, that's that's what we had planned. So we because it was supposed to be in Nashville, we we had we had tentatively written that we were going to okay. host it there, but they just announced that they're having a virtual meeting now, the BPS. Okay. Hey, Gordon means the APS meeting, not the BPS. Yeah, March APS March meeting. Which which will be hopefully not virtual next March. Oh. Well, it, just, it hasn't been set yet. Right, hopefully. Oh, so I don't know. Great. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, I think I have everything we need. And I'll write up a memo and action plan and send it to Margie, uh, Jose, and Herbie, and Peter, and then to run by them and then send it to everybody from the, in the community. Is that an okay solution? Yes, that sounds great. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Are there any other students who'd like to chime in? I know Zan mentioned it earlier, but I think it'd be really good to get um, high school science teachers involved as well. Um, just so that they even um, have like the idea to tell people that they should go to grad or not grad school, but like college for STEM and potentially get an actual job that pays well. Sounds good. We'll do. Okay, I'll, I'll um, Margie, I'll hand the microphone to you, platform to you. All right. Well, if if there are no other student comments, I think that wraps us up. I'll have one final email. There's only 30 of us left now, but um, I'll be sending out a final email um, kind of summarizing things and letting you know what's coming up next. And we'll have a lovely survey about how our meeting experience was. And I, I, Jose, do you have anything to say? Or I think it was a great meeting. I want to thank Margie. I want to thank the, all the people from Georgia Tech for all the organization and everybody that participated. I think it was a great success. Uh, there are many, many activities of polls going on. Make sure you are part of them. There are seminars every month. We have to get this group actually going and get other people to get involved in all these meetings. It's not only open for everybody, so try to make as much propaganda as you can. And on this last meeting, thanks Margaret, John, and Caitlin. You guys did a great job. And thanks all the speakers and students here. Were great talks, fantastic talks we had three, the entire week. Yes, indeed. I just wanted to add something. Uh, Margie, thanks a lot again. Uh, this wouldn't have happened without your organization. Just one last request. Um, is it... Um, uh, like if people wanted to contact other people who participated or, um, you know, the speakers, the students to get in touch with each other, um, um, you know, it would be nice to have an easy way to access people's emails. So, um, sure, I can. Um, I think it's there in the Rice website through the Rice website, but I was I'm not sure if the Oh, so, so all the Paul's node Right, information but is on. Have, uh, yeah, if there's an easy way, you have all the participant list. Like when, um, I wonder if that's something you could share with all the registrants. Yeah, so the list, it's up over, it's like 460 people. So I can share it. Maybe I can um, just email the, the spreadsheet. Yeah. That would be, that would be fine. Does it list who gave talks and posters? Yeah. Maybe we could have different sections or something. Yeah, I think that yeah. would be. Okay, that would be helpful. That way, uh, you know, students want to continue conversations. There were several questions that came up, and sure, sure you know, sure. Uh, we want to initiate collaborations, so that could be a way. Yes. To, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, all the polls people. Let's keep going. That was a great success. Let's keep just this network working better and better. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Margie, and everybody.